yes we'll continue uh, we have reached almost the end of chapter 18 uh, and we see that uh, there's a discussion that takes place between Pilate and Jesus and uh, Jesus says that everyone on the side of truth listens to me so do you want to be on the side of the truth are you willing to accept it but Pilate's response is ah what is truth okay so he is not willing to accept that there is one single universal truth uh, he believes it's just different belief systems that different people have and any anything goes is what uh, you know Pilate believes. So anyway, he feels that this whole thing is just some kind of uh, uh, controversy regarding uh, religious beliefs. And so he's not very concerned. He goes out to the crowd in verse 38. He goes out to the Jews who have gathered and he says to them, I find no basis for a charge against him. And after saying that I find absolutely no basis for a charge against him, he has Jesus flogged. Okay, so uh, if we could read out uh, chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and arrayed him in purple robes. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Uh, for us, Pastor? Yeah, go ahead, yes. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Okay, so uh, he declares that he finds no charge against Jesus, but he still goes ahead and has him flogged. He allows the soldiers to mock Jesus. He allows all of that uh, because he's kind of hoping that the Jews will be, you know, the leaders will be satisfied with that and they would just let Jesus go. Uh, so after all the mocking and the flogging and all of that, he brings uh, Jesus out again to the crowd, to the Jews who are gathered. And he says, you know, I, 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 I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Um, uh, Pilate is you know, uncomfortable with what is going on. Um, and so he's trying to, he's hoping that maybe they'll back off you know that they'll not want to uh, want to go ahead with the crucifixion. Uh, yes, we have um, brother Shay. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Um, so, I would, you, <clears throat> we just read that Jesus Christ was being flogged. Um, I I don't know if um, there is a historical background to. I mean, maybe yeah, yeah. A story background to what it meant to be flogged in the Roman Empire at that time, because it seems like as if Pilate telling them to flog Jesus was just going to be enough, you know, to get the crowd to disperse and let go of Jesus Christ. So I don't know. Could you share with us what was the details of the flogging? Because if the way John just wrote it, it's like he was just giving 10 strokes of the cane and told to go. But it looks like it was more than just just flo uh, flogging. So I don't know if you could just share with us, you know, maybe based on historical facts and um, that time of history, what it meant to be flogged in the Roman Empire at that time. Thank you. Ah, now I don't really know the details, but from uh, what little bit I have read, um, you know, the justice system at that time was more or less the same as, you know, the one we have now. Uh, sometimes the flogging was done as a deserved punishment. The crime has been proved. And so uh, they are, uh, you know, uh, giving him those lashes. Uh, you know, that uh, fixed number of lashes, they're giving him that because uh, they have now proved the case successfully against the, that particular criminal. And uh, so they are now whipping him for that crime. But then again, there were many occasions when they would uh, whip the poor criminal in the hope of getting a confession out of him, uh, when they still have not, not got any clear evidence against the man. And they still go ahead and do that because they hope that in the process of you know um, uh, whipping him, they can force that man into confessing to uh, to something, whether he has done it or not. Uh, so um, there were perversions of perversions of justice even back then. So uh, we 
cannot say that always uh, the flogging was justified. And um, over here in Jesus' case, we clearly see that it was not justified because Paul, uh, Pilate openly with his own mouth is saying, I find no charge against him. And yet he allows Jesus to be mocked. Uh, as for the mocking and all of that, yes, that is something that they were doing. It was just the whole process of you know um, uh, terrorizing that criminal uh, into submission. So there would be uh, physical uh, violence going on. At the same time, they would also want to emotionally tear down that person. Uh, so there would be a lot of mocking and uh, spitting and all of that involved. And uh, I don't know, there was this one place where it was actually written that they would, in fact, uh, crown the person, uh, you know, place a crown on that person's head and, uh, you know, mock him in that manner as well. So it's not like only in the case of Jesus that they did this. Um, there were occasions when soldiers would, you know, would go to the point where they would place a wreath on the person's head and uh, make fun of him. So uh, these are all things that depraved things that were done by depraved minds. And uh, these actions were not always justified. And uh, sometimes a person who had not even committed a crime would break down and confess to something which he has not even done just you know, to escape from all of this uh, mental torture. And it's very, very sad over here because Pilate has openly said, I find no charge against this person. And he has still allowed all of this to take place because he's still hoping that they'll back off and that uh, there would be no need for any crucifixion because he will have to put a signature for that crucifixion. And later, uh, you know, the Roman emperor Tiberius, you know, can pick on him and say, "Why did you go and send a, you know, an innocent man uh, to the cross?" So Pilate is still hoping that he will not have to put a signature that he that things can, you know, still cool off is what he is hoping for. Uh, yeah, I hope that helped. Yeah. Uh, so that means there's a possibility that the the beating was severe to to get the crowd off his back, and I guess it would most definitely be severe because they would use the same uh, you know method which they always used for all the floggings where they would use that um, uh, that whip which has got those um, uh, sharp things at the edge uh, so that when the whipping is going on it would tear the skin and then once the skin is torn the flesh under beneath that also starts getting torn uh, so they were not giving any spare, you know preferential treatment over here to jesus they were using the same flogging procedures which they always used uh, where they would use that particular whip uh, which has got uh, got those sharp objects at the edge uh, so it, yes it was a normal full fledged uh, flogging uh, just like they usually used you know in, in all cases yeah Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so now, after the flogging uh, and after all of the mockery, he now he brings um, Jesus out once again, and he says, uh, "Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him." And uh, then we have verses five and six happening. And if someone could read out that. Nineteen five and 6. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Okay, so uh, this is the third time that uh, Pilate is declaring uh, I find no basis for a charge against him. So he says, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. And um, then the leaders say, no, no, there is a charge against him. He has done something wrong. And they speak up. And uh, that we see in verses 7 to 11. And uh, it's interesting because there's a, you know interesting turn of events taking place over here. Uh, so maybe we could read right up to verse 12 7 to 12 if someone could read out please the jews answered him they have a law and according to the law he ought to die because he has made himself the son of god when pilate heard their statement he was even more afraid he entered his headquarters again and said to jesus 
Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From that time, will... Pilate. Was, was 12, yeah. From then on, Pilate thought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Yeah, so um, uh, three times Pilate has said, I find no basis of a charge for a charge against him. And then the in verse 7, the Jewish leaders declare and say, yes, there is a charge, at least as far as the Jewish law is concerned, because this man is declaring himself to be the son of God. And uh, uh, that kind of a claim deserves death is what they say. And when Pilate hears that, it says in verse 8, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. OK, so Pilate is uncomfortable with this whole situation. He does not want to crucify a person against whom he is not able to find any kind of charges. And now when he hears that this person is calling himself the son of God, it says that he was even more afraid. Because in the earlier conversation, Jesus had said, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, so now Pilate is a little worried. Asked, where do you come from? Because if your kingdom is not from here, are you really from, you know, from somewhere else? Are you from heaven? Are you really some kind of a God? He's, a, he's, he's rather concerned now. And then Jesus very boldly says to him, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. And um, when Pilate hears this, he's, he's genuinely scared. And it says in verse 12, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Uh, so a man who has always claimed to know to not care about you know religious things and all of that, uh, he actually feels afraid at this point. He can sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit happening in his heart. So you see, even powerful leaders, people in powerful positions, I think each person is at least given one chance where there is a kind of prompting of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, where they can sense that what is being said by these Christians is the truth. And um, they can feel that stirring. They can feel that. And what they do with that is up to them. They can you know, uh, place their political interests and uh, worldly interests above this stirring which they sense inside. And they can ignore it. Or they, may, they can choose to respond to it. But I really think even the topmost leaders, even the worst dictators uh, that we have in our you know, current world, um, I think they all are given at least one opportunity where each of them genuinely senses a stirring of the Holy Spirit inside, where they sense that what is being told over here is truth, and they better respond. And of course, if they just choose to ignore that and you know and harden their heart against it, then you know it's up to them. And that's what we see uh, happening over here. Pilate is, tries really hard to set Jesus free. And then, you know, they talk about his political position. They say, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So they say, you know, he's claiming to be a king. And here you are trying to support him. How is uh, the emperor Tiberius going to react when he hears about this? And when they bring up this point, then, you know, Pilate uh, uh, starts thinking about his position and his power. Um, because... Um, I'm not sure. It is somewhere in your notes. I think that it was mentioned that Tiberius, especially, was this real uh, paranoid character. Uh, you know, if even if he hears uh, uh, even one small uh, story of someone wanting to make themselves king or wanting to start a rebellion, uh, he would immediately lash out. Uh, so he was this extremely paranoid person. So if he ever got to know that Pilate had uh, openly tried to save the life of someone who's claiming to be a king then uh, Pilate would be finished. So 
now pilot you know he even though he had felt the stirring in his heart even though he felt that what he is doing is very very dangerous and he better not do it and uh, he goes to the extent of asking where are you from uh, because uh, he, maybe this really is the son of god so you know he's gone to that point uh, where he's almost on the verge of that revelation but he backs off and it says he sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement and he decides to you know give his judgment very foolish move he saved his political career uh, but oh what a loss you know uh, because he stayed alive for only a bunch of years after that for eternity uh, you know he's completely cut off from god what a terrible terrible decision so he sits down at that judge's seat and he makes his decision um so uh yeah so um of in in verse 16 it says finally pilate handed him over to them to be um crucified okay so um for the sake of his position pilate uh, he doesn't go with the prompting which he senses in his heart um moving to verses 17 18 i uh, yeah 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 go ahead brother yes Sorry, Pastor. I, I just, I just, I just saw an observation based on what we're talking about. You know, sometimes some people feel that the death of Jesus Christ was orchestrated, but we see God just walking in the midst of time, like in the midst of people's choices. It was not like as if God made Pilate um, execute, yes. um, give a judgment for his execution. It was just God walking through all these various circumstances of people making the choice, you know, to hand over Jesus. So this this shows that it was really truly that Jesus Christ gave Himself up. It was not like He made He actually made um, created the um, the idea of Him, you know, um, being killed by. Uh, the, the 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 Romans are then offered up by the Pharisees at that time. So this is just basically an observation that truly, you know, God just walked through the circumstance of men to bring about our salvation, and Jesus truly gave up His life for us. Yeah, very true. Um, because all the key players were given a chance to turn around. They all could have made a different decision. Uh, you know, Judas on the verge of you know going ahead with his betrayal, Jesus offers him the bread. Even at that point of time, Judas could have stepped back and you know said, uh, no, 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 you know I'll change my mind. But he chooses not to. And once he chooses not to, Satan enters into him. The leaders, the the religious leaders, so many debates where very openly, you know, Jesus breaks down their arguments. They were given a chance to believe the truth, and in fact, it says in one or two passages, many of the leaders began to believe after this, but they were afraid of the crowd and they kept silent. Uh, so, even all the key players were given a chance to change their minds, uh, but they chose not to. So, God never forced anyone at any point of time uh, to. Forcibly make them take him to the cross. They were given chances to repent. It's a choice that they did not make, and uh, so God works through the circumstances. You know, like you said, it's so true. Uh, when we go to verses 17 and 18, we see that um, Jesus is made to carry his cross, and um, that would uh, basically be the uh, the horizontal beam which you know uh, he would he would have been carrying. Uh, because the the vertical pole would already have been driven into the ground, you know, at the site wherever the crucifixion is supposed to take place. So the criminal would generally be made to carry the horizontal beam and walk through the crowd all the way to that location as a kind of public example, you know, um, uh, to to let all the people know that this is what will be done to you by the Roman government if you are foolish enough to, you know, indulge in a capital crime. So it was uh, more like a um, warning to all the people. So even as this criminal, whoever he is, is who's been you know uh, uh, given this death sentence, even as he's carrying that beam and going, everyone would stand over there, stare at him, and uh, it would probably scare them a little bit. 
and they would be careful not to do anything which will uh, you know cause them to be crucified by the roman garment um and um yeah, in your textbook, it talks about how in 1968, uh, they found the remains of a person who had been crucified during that era. And it talks about the, the way in which the crucifixion was done. And uh, so uh, that person, when he was crucified, uh, the nail was not driven into the palm of the hand, but rather the nail had been driven over here into the um, you know uh, forearm. Uh, because over here there would be a better grip uh, for the nail to stay because this bone would not allow the flesh to just rip through and you know come out so um, the nailing would have been done more in the around the wrist uh, or a little below the wrist rather than in the palm and also um, um, it talks about in your in your textbook uh, about the feet the feet would have been placed next to you know the side by side the two feet would have been placed side by side and the nail would have been driven through both of them from the sides uh, and not in the way we, we see in our paintings where you have one foot being placed above the other and then you have the nail going through them uh, that actually would be rather difficult uh, rather it would have been easier for them to drive the nails from the side and then into the wood you know so um and um, and uh, even the name of that man is um, you know, the, the remains of that person who was discovered. I read it in one of Lee Strobel's books. Um, I think the case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It gives details about that, about that, uh, you know, that skeleton which was found. And you get to know a lot of details about how the crucifixion was done in those days. And even the name of the man, um, uh, because on, on the on that uh, urn in which you know that that uh, clay that clay pot in which he had been preserved uh, his name is in fact written on that uh, clay urn and uh, so this is a historical fact you know so uh, they got to know a lot of details about how the crucifixion was done back then um, based on this particular skeleton um, versus 19 to 22 um, yeah this is interesting yeah if someone could read out verses 19 to 22 please Also wrote an inscription right on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Near the Jews wrote this inscription over the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and was written in early in the Mokhtin He was still killed by the whole fact of life. Do not but the King of the Jews, but rather, this man says, not only the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. To an extent, Pilate is trying to safeguard his own interests when he makes this notice and puts it up, uh, because the notice very clearly says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So um, later, if you know uh, some, some superior asks him, why did you uh, crucify this person? At least he'll be able to say, no, no, this person was claiming to be the king. And that's the reason why um, I crucified him. So I do have a legal grounds for, uh, you know, uh, signing off on the crucifixion. So Pilate puts up the notice and he puts it up in three different languages. Uh, so everyone who's passing by will be able to understand what are the charges being brought against this Jesus. And the Jewish leaders are very, very unhappy uh, that it says over there, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So they say, why, why have you written that? Like as if he is the king of the Jews, you should have written that he's claiming to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate just says, what I have written, I have written. Uh, because Pilate is, um, um, has kind of sensed in his heart that what Jesus is speaking is true and that there are bigger issues you know, at work. But at the same time, of course, uh, Pilate has made his decision that he'd rather hold on to his position uh, rather than uh, you know, take the side of the truth. Uh, so he is um he does believe to an extent that jesus is, is indeed the king of the jews and so he says what i have written i have written uh, so uh, the leaders are very upset because now everyone who looks at that will probably believe that he is indeed the king of the jews and they are not very happy with that idea um uh, verses 23 to 24 
yeah, that's basically where it talks about how his uh, clothes were divided. Uh, so uh, these soldiers, you know, whatever they could get from the criminal who's being crucified, uh, they would uh, split it up between them. Um, I guess the soldiers were not really very well paid. Uh, they would adjust with whatever, you know, um, not very educated people, uh, just a lot of, you know, violent people, I suppose. So here they are dividing up his clothes and um, it talks about how uh, the garment that Jesus was wearing was woven from one single piece of cloth. And that is significant. Uh, because when we go to Exodus chapter 28, verses 31 and 32, we see that um, when they would make the high priest's garment, that's the way they would make it. They would make the whole thing with one single piece of cloth. It's woven together. So they don't attach two pieces of cloth and you don't have you know, a hemming and a, uh, the, the stitching on the two sides joining the two pieces of cloth. You have one single piece of cloth and it's woven in such a way that it just has one opening on the top you know, for the, for the neck. And uh, there are some details about how exactly you should create the neck for the dress uh, you know, in your Exodus chapter 28, verses 31 and 32. So the point being made over here is that Jesus is wearing something which indicates his high priestly role. You know, it's amazing. He's over there hanging on that cross. And um, uh, the clothes which he had been wearing indicate, uh, you know, his high priestly role. Um, so we see the beauty of that. Then uh, coming to verses uh, 25 to 27, that's basically where Jesus is now uh, committing his mother into the hands of John. So we very clearly see that John has decided to join the ladies at the foot of the cross and not just hide somewhere else, uh, you know, which is, uh, in fact, a very wonderful thing. Um, if someone could read out verses 25 to 27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sisters, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing near them, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son, whom he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her to his own son. Okay, so uh, uh, here Jesus is. Uh, not focused so much on his own pain and what he's going through. He still thinks about the others. And so uh, now he's thinking about his mother and her future. And so he makes the statement uh, and he says, you know, from now on, um, you know, here is your son. So now she's committing, uh, he's committing his mother into the hands of John. And um, for John, this would have uh, been a very uh, high sign of honor. Uh, because, you know, whenever you had uh, uh, the disciples belonging to a master and if that master kind of um, gives them responsibilities like this, it's like a privilege. You know, it's like as if the master is saying, you know, I really trust you. Uh, so I'm giving this uh, personal responsibility to you. So here Jesus is committing his own mother into the hands of uh, this disciple. So for the disciple, it would have been a very high mark of honor that he has been chosen from among all of the disciples for this role. And uh, uh, so um, from that time onwards, uh, John would have taken care of her. Um, moving into verses 28 to 30. Um, that's basically where uh, they give him some um, wine vinegar to drink. And uh, then you have verse 30 where Jesus says it is finished. Um, maybe we can actually read those words. Uh, 28 to 30, if someone could read out, please. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
uh, yeah. Uh, in one of the gospels, we see that uh, earlier on during the crucifixion, someone offers him um, um, uh, this particular liquid, which will, you know, kind of dull the pain. And uh, when Jesus realizes what it is, he refuses to drink it because uh, he wants to be completely alert and he wants to go through the whole process because he's doing it on behalf of humankind. And uh, so he does not want the pain to be dulled. So he refuses to drink uh, you know, the earlier liquid which is given to him. But over here it says in verse 28, later, knowing that everything has now been finished, so it's all been completed, all that needs to be done on the cross has been completed. So now he is willing to partake of, uh, you know, the, uh, whatever they're giving him. And uh, so now he says, I am thirsty. And uh, this is a direct reference to uh, Psalm 22, verse 15. And uh, it, it's very interesting because in Psalm 22, you know, there are many, many verses which refer directly to this crucifixion event, including the dividing of the clothes, uh, you know, among the soldiers. Uh, so even that is mentioned in Psalm 22. So in Psalm 22, 15, it talks about if someone could read out that because it's uh, it's interesting to see what Jesus was actually going through. Psalm 22, 15. Polly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of... Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. You, no, no, Proverbs. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> Psalm 20, my strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to... Oh, yeah. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Amen. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it literally stays, says here, my you know, tongue is, you know, stuck to the jaws. Um, in the sense, uh, the, his mouth is gone so dry uh, that uh, there's no there's no moisture left over there. You know, deliberately, he refused to drink the earlier uh, portion that was given and so now he's been reduced to a very dehydrated state and now uh, now that everything that he requires to do as high priest is now finished it's completed and so now he says I am thirsty and now he drinks that wine vinegar which has been given to him and you know like we had talked about many many classes ago right in the beginning of our course um, in those days they didn't really have much potable water uh, the water sources were not very pure. So a lot of people drank these things, wine vinegar, um, uh, grape juice, which was diluted. These are the things which they used for daily, uh, you know, daily usage for for for, uh, for drinking, for, for thirst. So um, I think, yeah, it's in your notes where it says that it's generally the soldiers and laborers who would use this kind of a wine vinegar or a sour wine. Uh, because it's, it was cheaper, it was easier to you know get hold of. So it was so that is why they have probably had a jar of that sitting nearby because you know you had a lot of soldiers over there, and uh, so they hand over that to Jesus, and he finally drinks it. And uh, then in verse thirty, he says, "It is finished." He says, and uh, because now that he has finished his task, now that it is completed, he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. And uh, so it's very, very clear over here that um, he chooses when he wishes to die, at which point of time he, he, he will be giving up his spirit. And um, so whatever he had said earlier in John chapter 10, uh, verses 17 and 18, where he says, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. So Jesus chooses when he is going to give up his spirit and the timing is entirely in his control. Um, because he is not subject to the circumstances, rather he is running the circumstances and doing whatever he wishes done, you know, at that particular point of time. And uh, uh, another interesting point that comes out over here is that uh, Jesus says, you know, I thirst. The one who said to the Samaritan woman, I will give you living waters, uh, which will, uh, you know, take away your thirst forever so that you will never be thirsty again. Uh, so, he is allowing himself to thirst. He allows himself to, the, to thirst to the extent where his tongue gets stuck to the roof of his mouth. He allows himself to thirst to that extent so that we uh, will never thirst again. 
so uh, we have all of these beautiful things coming out you know in this passage here and um, of course jesus words where he says it is finished now uh, to what extent do we believe these words uh, i think uh, a lot of power is contained in these words if we really believe these words it is finished it can make a huge difference in our everyday life um, because uh, he is talking about what he has accomplished so you know we are very very familiar with isaiah 53 3 to 5 but whatever it says over there in isaiah 53 3 to 5 that is what he finished that is what he declared as being completely finished um, not partially done not 99 percent completed but totally 100 percent finished achieved accomplished and only after Isaiah 53, 3 to 5 has been fully accomplished, then he takes the wine, allows it to dull him, and then he just, you know, gives up his spirit. Uh, so if we could just look at Isaiah 53, 3 to 5, you know, as a reminder to ourselves. If someone could read out that passage, please. Isaiah 53, 3 to 5. Isaiah 53, 3 to 5. He was despised yes. and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. So it says here that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So the forgiveness that he offers now is complete, total. It's not like as if he has, you know, kind of given us forgiveness 99%, but there's this 1% of guilt which we need to continue living with. No, it's 100% righteousness that has now been imparted to us. Uh, so it is true that we fail the Lord even now sometimes, you know, and we fall away. Uh, but we can always, you know, ask for forgiveness and come back to him. Why? Because when we chose to accept him as Lord and we placed ourselves under him, under his lordship, he imparted 100% righteousness to us because he has you know, paid the price for every single transgression of ours. He has uh, you know, been bruised for every iniquity which we have ever committed and will commit in the future. So it's a completed work. So we would never, we, we should never think that, oh, there are these particular sins of mine which, you know, remain unforgiven. Every single um, uh, sin has already been forgiven. It's a total, complete work that has been done. And moreover, it says the chastisement was for our peace was upon him. So now that the peace which exists between us and the Father is a complete peace, he no longer is looking upon us with judgment. He no longer is angry with us. He now completely loves us and accepts us in the same way that he loves Jesus. He loves us as well. There is no gap between the Father and us. The peace that has been established between the Father and us is complete. It's a 100% acceptance, a 100% uh, reconciliation that has been achieved between the Father and us because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And in the same way, it says in the last portion, by his stripes, we are healed. Um, so the healing that has been given to us, uh, a, a, both emotionally and in our physical bodies, it is a 100% healing that is being you know now offered. It's not just partial. It is a completed work. So if we truly believe those words which Jesus spoke, you know, he said, it is finished. In verse 28, it, uh, John 19, 28, he says, knowing that everything had now been finished, then Jesus says, I am thirsty. And then after drinking, he says, uh, in verse 30, it is finished. Now, what we believe uh, will um, 
you know what what will happen for us will be in accordance with what we believe because it says in first thessalonians 2:13 um very very important verse you know if uh, someone could read out that first thessalonians 2:13 Please, could someone read out? First Thessalonians two thirteen, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a word of men, but as what it really is—the word of God which is at work in you believers. Yeah. uh you know over here it is saying uh, paul is speaking to these believers in uh, thessalonica and he says uh, the words which we presented to you you didn't dismiss them as human words but you accepted them as what they actually are which is the word of god himself and he says which is indeed at work in you who believe the word of god is at work only in those people who literally believe it as the word of god and that god will never lie so what he is saying is 100% accurate and correct so if you really believe that and you don't even doubt that the words which he has spoken are really true then that word is going to work in you in all of its power unlimited because you have accepted those words literally as being true it's not just being maybe 99% true but 100% true this very very great power in this so if anyone chooses to believe these words which jesus spoke on the cross after he had finished his work when he said it is finished he was talking about all the things in isaiah 53 3 to 5 as finished completed works and if we truly believe that then uh, what we believe this word which we believe it will work in our lives in our bodies with in great power because we have accepted it as the word of god as being truth uh, and we have not doubted it uh, so the power uh, the the word of god will be able to work inside us in our lives in our minds in our bodies in all of its power um, so we need to believe and if we believe this word will work in us in all of its power um coming very quickly to verses 31 to 37 um yeah you have the um the corpses have you know being taken down from the crosses and um when it comes to uh, jesus case uh, they want to make sure that he you know he has indeed uh, died and so in verse 34 you have one of the soldiers piercing jesus side with a spear um and um then in verse 36 it talks about how his bones uh, were not broken and uh, yeah verse 37 talks about how they will look upon him whom they have pierced so all of these details john is putting down over here because all of these verses are very very clearly fulfilling prophecies which were given in the old testament and um, so you have psalm 34 19 to 20 um in which it talks about how a righteous person his bones will be protected not one of them will be broken that's actually what psalm 34 19 to 20 talks about it says the righteous person may have many troubles uh, but you know the lord delivers him from them all he protects all his bones not one of them will be broken so uh, uh here uh, it's emphasizing the righteousness of jesus jesus did not hang on that cross because of anything that he had done he was completely spotless and he was completely righteous and uh, so all his bones were protected they were not broken and then uh, you have the other you know prophecy being fulfilled uh, you know exodus 12:46 where it talks about the passover lamb 
the passover's lamb lamb's bones should never be broken so in exodus 12 46 uh, where instructions are being given by moses to the people on how they should eat the passover lamb there it says do not break any of the bones so again over here uh, you know jesus role not just as the righteous one but also his role as the passover lamb is being emphasized and then uh, you have the zechariah 12 10 scripture where it talks about um, how they will look on me the one they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son so over here it talks about how the people who have pierced him uh, one day they will look upon him and they will be they will be repentant for what they have done and they will grieve as though for a firstborn son and uh, so over here uh, Jesus status as the firstborn son is being emphasized so there are, there's a lot of old testament scripture which is getting fulfilled in this particular passage and so uh, John you know mentions all of these details over here under the inspiration of the holy spirit so that uh, to show to show especially the jewish readers of that time you know that look all the things which the uh, old testament scriptures had been telling about the messiah all of these things are getting fulfilled in jesus um okay so um and yeah we are almost out of time uh, so coming to the very last few verses verses 38 to 42 uh, we have jesus being uh, uh, being wrapped up in linen and being placed in the tomb uh, if if someone could just read out verses 40 and 41 please So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in lying clothes with the spices of its burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jews, their preparation, since the tomb was closed at home, they laid Jesus there. Yeah. Uh, so um, they wrap his uh, body in linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Okay. So uh, generally, uh, the crucified criminals would just be left over there because nobody would even want to claim them. Uh, so they would either be put in a common grave, or they would, or you know, they were the 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 body would just be thrown somewhere, and then uh, it would be eaten by wild animals. That's that's what would happen to many criminals. But over here, um, uh, Jesus is loved. He is somebody who has been you know, uh, respected and revered, and so his followers are coming forward now to perform uh, the necessary ceremonies. So they wrap his. Uh, body in linen uh, according to the proper respectful jewish burial customs and um, it's very interesting what it says in verse 41 it says at the place where jesus was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid okay so they placed jesus over there and it's very very important to i know uh, grasp this that it was a new brand new tomb it had never ever been used because if we know anything about these you know uh, jewish burial customs of that time those who are well to do those who are wealthy enough would have their own family um, tomb and in the tomb would be the remains of all the different family members you know down the generations uh, so the basic procedure is that when a person passes away uh, they would you know wrap them in linen according to the correct procedures and that person would be laid out over there in the tomb for maybe a few years and once the body has kind of you know shrunk and shriveled up and all the moisture is now escaped uh, you know and all the organs have dried up inside uh, so when when it reaches that stage then they uh, they are able to move that body into one of those um, narrow in that tomb you would have a whole bunch of compartments, um, maybe like a shelf, you know, uh, a kind of long, deep shelf. So each um, each remains 
would be put into one of those you know compartments so that way they would create space for entire generations and this would be the family tomb so for the first few years uh, that body would be kept in a separate place you know where it can dry up and all of that and then the remains would be put into one of those little ossuaries is the technical term i know it would be put into one of those and so in this particular tomb there are no other corpses only one single person has been placed over here for the very first time and that is jesus so when the resurrection happens and jesus disappears there's no body left over there inside it's a brand new tomb there are no other old bodies lying around on the other hand if they had used a new, you know an old tomb which already has other remains in there what would the jewish leaders have done they would have said ha ah, see you know this body which is over here that's actually jesus it's, you know he just seems to have uh, deteriorated extra fast but actually this is jesus body they could have said that but this was a brand new tomb and there are no other remains inside only one single person was laid inside and that person on the third day has vanished has disappeared has risen so now no false claims can be made they cannot twist the story and say ah you know no 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 the body over there that extra body that you see over there that actually that is is jesus nobody could say that so it is very very vital that a brand new tomb be used to back up the resurrection and prove beyond all doubt that the one who had been laid in there rose from the dead and is no longer dead uh, so we see that important detail detail coming out of course in our modern day you know you would just have to do dna testing to find out which body belongs to whom of course in that day they did not have all of those things and so it was very very important that a brand new tomb be used for jesus burial and uh, which is what god arranges for in this particular case through joseph of uh, arimathea uh, so yeah we see all of these things and uh, yeah we don't really have any time for questions uh, so let's just you know close with a word of prayer yeah lord we just thank you so much for uh, many of the details that we could dwell upon uh, thank you lord for what you did for us on the cross um, thank you lord that you went through the whole process uh, not hesitating not holding back until everything that needed to be done for our redemption and restoration was finished was completed and only then oh lord uh, you said it is finished so we thank you that in you we have complete total eternal hope all our sins are completely forgiven the peace which has been established between us and the father is total and complete we are totally accepted by him and we thank you o oh lord that in you we can genuinely claim uh, healing even for our illnesses and our sicknesses and our diseases thank you o oh lord that what you did was a finished complete work and lord even as we have looked at these two chapters and we have seen all that you went through all the um the the humbling and all of the disgrace that you put up with the oh lord for our sake it's amazing it shows us how deeply you love us the oh lord and we thank you for that may we always honor you and glorify you in our lives thank you lord in jesus name amen amen yeah thank you so much thank you pastor thank you